Hello, Big Dude here. Now that I've achieved all my goals in the demo version of Kerbal Space Program, I've decided to move on to the full version, where I have some rather ambitious goals uh, to accomplish in here. Uh, what you're looking at is the booster stage that is going to carry my first space station into orbit. It's a small space station, it's a simple station. Uh, it has a cupola on top to give the station operator or commanding view of operations. It has four arms extending out with um, docking ports on the end for ships to dock with, a uh, habitat module, and uh, five RCS tanks uh, attached to it. Beneath that there is a big fuel tank and a skipper engine which will be used to um, push the ship around in orbit because it's, um, it's a 30 ton spacecraft. Uh, but for now, let's see how she flies. So here's where I'm going to speed the video up about four times normal speed and, and the reason for that is that when we get up to about 68,000 meters uh, the mission clock is going to tell you that we've been flying for about five minutes. Uh, but when I look at the raw video uh, it will say that it took 30 minutes. Um, yep, take time out to look around the cupola. Jebediah has a commanding view of the environment although I'm sure he's blinded by that sunlight that he's going to be staring into there. Um, but anyway, um, first stage booster separation goes fine. And as you can see, it's a complicated uh, mission. Um, the spacecraft required an awful lot of power to get this 30-ton uh, space station uh, into orbit. Uh, and it's not just that it's 30 tons, um, it's also that it's, it has a lot of air resistance because it's got you've got the arms going out at the 90 degree por uh, points and then at the 45 degree points you've got all these boosters and it's just like flying a trying to fly a brick wall into space um, so that's why the thing flew so slow um, and it would have flown slow anyway even if if it, um, if not for that because there was a lot of lag this is a 310 part spacecraft and um, when you get up to 310 parts, uh, Kerbal Space Program doesn't quite like that. Here we go. Next stage booster separation. Third stage booster separation. Fourth stage boosters ignited. Um, and uh, the spacecraft was surprisingly responsive. Um, even when it came time to do the roll program, um, it rolled over quite well. Um, it didn't quite make it to 90 degrees. It, again, all that uh, stuff sticking out, fighting the um, airflow. Um, so it did kind of get off a little bit, but it was a lot more responsive than a lot of other spacecraft have been. It doesn't drift too far off. And um, I'm able to stop it and make corrections. And fortunately, it flies in a straight line, which is what's most important. Um, we go back to the cupola. Or apparently, um, I thought for a moment Jeb and I had pulled the um, uh, blast shades or something, the blast curtains, but as it turns out, you could see the sun behind one of the ribbings of the, uh, of the cupola. Uh, but for a moment, I was a little freaked out as to why I was seeing jet black sky. It took a while to realize that there, there, there comes a point in your, in your flight where, as you look straight up, it's, uh, it's dark, but there's too much sun glare for you to actually see stars. So it'll take a while for the stars to come out. Here we see RCS fighting the uh, to um, align the spacecraft. But again, it, it, it was pretty stable going up. But getting back to the mission timer, um, like I said, it took 
uh, the mission timer will say soon that it, at five minutes, uh, that it took five minutes to get up to 68,000 meters, but um, the raw video said 30 minutes. And it certainly felt like 30 minutes doing this. Um, you know, those separatrons get a little crazy uh, as they push things away, but I, I've, I've had those boosters um, hit parts of the spacecraft before. You'll notice that my uh, main booster is four, I believe they're LVT-30s, um, and off of the, um, I forget the name of the fuel tank that ignites. And I, I did that instead of the mainsail engine. I've had issues with the mainsail overheating. By using that arrangement with the LVT-30s, I get just as much lift, <coughs> um, or comparable, I get enough lift. And I don't have to deal with the overheating issue. Uh, this is the skipper engine, which I use as a second um, main stage. Um, what am I up to? Five stages? Six stages now? Um, but it's my, my last stage until I get, uh, until I'm forced to run off of the um, station's engines. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing, getting back to the mission timer clock, I'm guessing that, let's see, I've heard that a minute in Kerbal Space Program is equal to a real minute. An hour is equal to a real hour. Um, this is before they changed the, the days. The days are now six hours, where I think they used to be 24. But a second is not a second. Um, I guess if there's lag, if you're, if you're flying a ship with 310 parts, then a second isn't quite going to be a second. And of course, lest we forget, we can credit some of that lag to my humble Acer Aspire, uh, which just wasn't designed to run uh, graphic intensive games. Here we go, nice view of the uh, Kerbal Space Center, as, and a nice view of the stars, which brings me, which makes for a good segue into what this space station is all about. Why am I putting this uh, bucket of bolts up in space? And the answer is, uh, you probably have noticed in my uh, previous videos that I um, have a tendency to run out of fuel a lot, um, all the time. And um, so I started thinking how I could get around that. And um, what I started, it, it, which brought me to Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek, uh, if you noticed, often has a nautical theme to the spacecraft. Uh, you have, of course, Starfleet. Um, the the Klingon, uh, is off, Klingon Empire is often referred to as having a fleet, as are the Romulans. Um, if you remember, <coughs> pardon me, um, if you remember, what was the movie, um, the one that sucked, um, the Final Frontier. Um, that In that movie, there was a scene in which Captain Kirk um, and the others were on uh, some part of the ship, uh, the captain's lounge or whatever it was, and it was a big uh, steering wheel, the type that you would see on a wooden ship, the type you would see in parts of the Caribbean. And um, uh, that was just a regular part of, um, of the, the features of that, of that, even though it didn't work, of course. Um, but it was just something that was put in there out of tradition. Um, if you've ever read any of the books, the Star Trek books, the technical ones on, on how the vessels work, how the, the ships work, uh, Starfleet is referred to, the Klingons and Romulans are referred to as having a navy in the books. Um, if you remember, um, what was the the final ca con first, contact? first contact movie, Lieutenant Commander Worf is promoted to commander on a replica of the original sailing ship Enterprise. Pardon me, uh, Jebediah had to do some, uh, conduct some communications with ground control. Um, but yeah, that, that scene in the movie took place uh, on a replica of the USS Enterprise. From um, uh, from the Revolutionary War. Um, in fact, the very name Enterprise, of course, is 
invokes uh, is a, 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 a naval name. Um, and where am I going with this? Well, it, all this naval talk started, got me thinking about the U.S. Navy. Um, when in the latter half of the 19th century, when take time out for the onboard computer to talk to the space center. Um, anyway, um, a lot of half the 19th century when the U.S. Navy began um, uh, transitioning from uh, sailing ships to uh, steam-powered ships, uh, monitors, and the later dreadnoughts, they, these things were powered by coal. So the Navy, the, all the, Navy, the major navies of the world that, that did this, uh, had to establish what was called coaling stations. Uh, these coaling stations were places ships would go to take on coal uh, so they could uh, continue traveling. Later, when ships uh, moved from coal to um, uh, liquid fuel, diesel fuel, or, or bulk oil, um, they had tankers that followed the Navy around. Even to this day, you, know, you may have a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier can travel for 13 years between refueling but it still needs tankers to follow it around to refuel the, um, the airplanes to continue uh, air operations. I was already thinking what the Kerbals need to improve their space program is a refueling station in space um, that would act as a, a central hub uh, for tankers. It's not going to be, I'm not going to have all my ships go up there to refuel after launch, but I will have uh, a tanker fleet that will follow um, the space expeditions um, wherever they're needed, to the moon, to the, or to the moon, to Minmus, to the outer planets, wherever. Um, and these fuel, these station, these tankers can be launched and then they can either be pre-positioned around other planets or they can just follow the, um, the expeditionary ship, the, 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 the research ship or they can just be waiting in orbit and um, sort of uh, use this space station as uh, this tank, or this space station is a place for all the tankers to rendezvous, um, top off fuel, transfer fuel, because the tankers themselves will need a full tanker fuel in order before they go on and help someone out. So that's the plan behind this space station. Okay. Because the station is going to, uh, you see those four arms sticking out. That's where the tankers are going to dock. Oh. It's Jeb and I on the onboard computer talking to Mission Control. Um, and um, here we go with a. Gemini's view of, uh, of the planet below and of space. Um, this couple of was a little disappointing. I thought these side windows would enable me, enable Gemini to look out, to have a commanding view over the, the tankers themselves and the, and the arms, so we can watch the tankers as they pull up. But as you can see, it, it doesn't show anything. It just go, I mean, it shows space pretty darn well, but you can't see the tankers at all from any angle. And he's got a supply of snacks. That's nice. Always need those. Um, but yeah, we can't actually see the space station itself from, from within here. Um, so I, I don't think there is a, a module I could attach that would do that. Later on, I might move down to the habitat module and see if there's a view from there. So now that we find ourselves in a stable 100 kilometer uh, equatorial orbit, uh, me and Jebediah start the process of uh, checking out all the space station's uh, systems to make sure everything works. Uh, first up is to turn on the monopropellant tanks. Um, the, the space station has five of the cylindrical monopropellant tanks all attached to the uh, habitat module. And I turned them off before launch uh, so that we could run entirely on I guess I'm going on with the camera there. Um, they're going to run entirely on um, 
uh, the big RCS tank that was part of the booster system um, that was since jettisoned. And uh, that way, when we got into space, we would uh, turn on the monopropellant tanks, and we'd have full five full tanks of, of uh, RCS. Uh, so we got to go around, look at the station from all angles, make sure all the systems are turned on. Next up is to check out the space station's uh, lighting systems. Um, one thing I wanted to do was use the same um, nav lighting system that is uh, uh, that has been set up for the international. There are international standards for navigational lighting on spacecraft, which is uh, simply one red light to note the left side of the spacecraft, one green light for the right side, a flashing strobe on top, and a yellow or amber light on the underside. Um, there's actually only one uh, spacecraft that uh, uses this lighting system, and that is the, um, um, I believe it's the Dragon X um, spacecraft that's used uh, to uh, ferry uh, uh, cargo up to the International Space Station. And that's so the, um, uh, the astronauts on board who control the spacecraft in its final uh, docking sequence can, can orient, can understand the orientations of the of the uh, of the capsule. Um, however, you'll notice I made a mistake and I accidentally put the red light on the left side and the on the right side. Pardon me, and I accidentally put the green light on the left side. So I already screwed up the um, how the lighting is supposed to work. Um, and there's actually four systems of the red green lights, and all four of them are wrong. Uh, but the idea was whenever a tanker is closing in, as I close in on one of these docking ports, um, I would have the, the amber on the bottom, which you see there, um, and then I would have a strobe light on the top. Oh, this is something different entirely. This is the uh, official lighting of the Kerbal Empire, uh, which of course is green because that's the color of Kerbals. Um, Anyway, the idea was uh, this utility lighting that you see here. Um, but as you close in in a, in a spacecraft, you would see um, uh, the amber light on the bottom, the flashing strobe on the top directly above you, and the red and green on either side of the arm. And um, each arm has its own set of nav lights, so as you approach, no matter what angle you approach from, um, I would have an easier time docking the spacecraft. But um, it really hasn't helped at all, um, actually. And you'll get an idea as to why not, you know, at a later date when I uh, bring the tankers up, which will actually be my next video. Here we open up the spacecraft's um, solar panels. Uh, I wonder if I should have put the bigger ones on. But, um, I don't know, the station's not going to have a lot of power demand. So I, I did use the big. Uh, battery ring. Whoops, close them up. Uh, by accident there. Um, I use the spacecraft's. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I use the big battery ring for the station, um, which uh, should leave me with more than enough power, so I can leave the lights on 24/7. Uh, um, that's really the only power requirement the station has. Um, aside from that, it's just going to sit there and wait for tankers to show up. And, transfer fuel about. I'm having a little issue with the um, with the lighting, turning them on and off and such. I don't know why these... They looked a lot better when I tested them on the ground. They? Or they worked a lot better. So these... That strobe I don't, isn't supposed to be on when everything else is on. But anyhow, close in, get a nice cinematic shot while we open up the um, solar panels for real this time. There you go. That's a nice shot. And I went with the big battery ring because I figured 
even though the station doesn't have a lot of power demands, um, I decided to take sort of a Boy Scout approach to it. I'd, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Um, there we are over the ocean. Check out the view from inside the cupola. So now we set up the last of the spacecraft systems before I put her to bed for the evening. And that will first include, hmm, seems I don't have enough power to run the reaction wheels. That's odd. I've got a big battery ring. We have 4,000 units, so it should be enough. Maybe I need to, hmm, maybe it's something I should address in the future. Um, anyhow, uh, what I want to do is give the, um, give the station a name, uh, refueling launch vehicle doesn't sound quite right. So, I actually had to cut some of this out because I actually sat there for like five minutes with Ref uh, sitting on the screen. And um, I didn't want to, most tankers are named Exxon this or Chevron that. I didn't want to give it a corporate name. So I named it after the North Star, the North Star Refueler. There you go. Not a bad name. Jebediah seems to like it. So there you have it, the successful orbiting and setup of my first space station. Not too bad for a guy who's crashed and burned on the moon more times than I can count. <laughs> hmm, here's that white light that always appears in the dark side of the planet. I wonder what causes that. Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video, please light up that like button and subscribe. And as a new feature to this channel, I'm going to be putting a, a list of the mods I use in Kerbal Space Program at the end of the outro. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.